Thank you. So I'm Daniel Weisberg, analytics advocate at Google. And my job is to help people make better decisions using data. So today I would like to talk a little bit about uh, how to use data uh, to go from, uh, how to use stories to go from data to insights. And so 11 years ago I left Brazil where I grew up uh, to study my master's in Israel. And this is Tel Aviv University where I did my master's. And basically I knew some Hebrew and you know, I, I knew how to communicate. And I knew how to count, and you know, it's very important to know how to count the, you know, to study operations research. And I remember my first course was especially hard, and you know, it was the mathematical and statistical models for uh, decision making. And one of the things that I remember very clearly was that uh, I couldn't understand every single word that the professor was saying, but I didn't understand anything about, you know, what he was talking about. And it was very strange because, you know, I couldn't link between the words. And, you know, it, it looked a little bit like that, right, the connecting the dots. And I think that the, the way we communicate data is very similar because very often what we do is, you know, throwing data points at people or throwing charts at people. And, you know, they understand some things, right? You can understand here that, you know, there are some people, they're talking to each other, but people don't really understand the context or, you know, the story of the data behind it. So today I'm going to talk about, you know, the red lines, which is, you know, the context that you need to add to the data so that you know, it can be more meaningful. Now, so first of all, what's a story? And there is one uh, professor at Stanford doing very interesting research. Her name is uh, Jennifer Acker, and she's doing research on how to use stories in a business context. And I'd like to show a video that she prepared, an anim uh, animated movie for uh, the future of storytelling. So. When most of us think of advocating for ideas, we go to statistics. We go to convincing arguments, facts, and figures. But studies show that if we share a story, people are more likely to remember the message, be persuaded by it, feel personally connected to it. And when data and stories are used together, audiences are moved both intellectually and emotionally. For lasting effect, you need to persuade the rational brain, but also resonate with the emotional brain. Recent behavioral research has shown why stories are so powerful. It's because they're meaningful. Those who tell the best stories will become the best leaders. If we consider the simple question, what is the story or why am I doing this? We may find we make very different choices of how we spend our time. Isabella Allende once wrote, silence before being born, silence after death. Life is nothing but noise between those two unfathomable silences. But there is signal and there is noise. And how do we reduce the noise? Story. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce the noise to get the sign up, right? And so when you go to the dictionary to look at the definition of story, the first one, you know, it's a connected series of, uh, of events, a description of a connected series of events. And then there is, you know, a report of something that has happened. And then there is a lie, right, that this guy is just telling stories. And I would like to, you know, focus on the first one because I think, you know, in a business context, what we are trying to do is to explain a connected series of events, which is, you know, I invested this much money on a campaign, for example, and then it brought this number of users and, you know, they visited, you know, they did this kind of... Uh, uh, actions and you know they brought this amount of money to to uh, to the company right so this is connected series of events and I think that's the best uh, description for uh, stories in a business context. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, you know framework that I've been using. Uh, I've been doing a, a data project at Google, so I'm I'm trying to find stories in you know some data sets and I've used this uh, this framework. And I think those six things are, you know, what I think they're really important when you go, you know, from the very beginning when you're thinking about, you know, an analysis or, you know, a story and then you want to turn that into something meaningful. Now, the first thing, the audience. So I have kids at home and, you know, Hulk, I think it's great. And when you start, you know, with very small kids, you have, you know, the Lego Hulk and, and then as you grow up, you have other types of holes, like they're, they're a little bit more uh, 
scary or violent, but they're still you know, animated movies until you get you know, the Incredible Hulk, which uh, smashes things and it's, it's really, really scary. And what I think about defining audiences is that you know, very often when we do analysis, we, we don't start by thinking who is going to listen to the analysis, right? And, and I think you know, when you're talking to you know, executives, you're thinking about you know, diff very different uh, types of charts or very different types of uh, analysis than when you're talking to a data analyst that you know, probably is very interested in you know, the methods and the data and, and other uh, very detailed things. So I think you know, the first step in you know, doing an analysis should always be you know, the audience because that, that will define which type of data you need and which type of, of uh, analysis you'll conduct. Now the second thing, creating hypothesis. So writer's block, everyone knows what's the writer's block, which is you know, when a writer cannot have any idea to, to, to write about. And, and I consider myself a writer. I write emails all the day. And, but I'm going to talk about the analyst block, which is you know, everyone knows how, how it is to you know, look at a data set. And you know, you know that it's really, really interesting, but you just don't know where to start or what to do with the data set. And I'd like to use a, a comic strip, The Shape of Ideas, by uh, Grant Snyder, which is a great cartoonist. And he has a website called Incidental Comics. So great uh, illustrator. Now, The Shape of Ideas is about you know, coming up with ideas to do something. right? And I like to go over them because I think they're very useful when doing analysis as well. So the first one, ideas that you know, glow bright at night. They're not, they might not be as bright in the morning, and you know, I'm a big fan of uh, night walks, so that's uh, the way I have ideas to do things. And you know, literally, when I wake up in the morning, you know, sometimes the ideas they're really terrible. And you know, I think one one very important thing when you're thinking about new analysis, you know, sleeping with the idea and you know, talking to other people, because sometimes an idea that looks really good for you, it's not as good for other people. Now, the second thing, do not destroy old ideas, and I think. You know, that's also you know, something that uh, is very useful to keep you know, a graveyard of ideas, that things that you know, you're not going to use right now, but you know, they might be very, very helpful in the future. So just keep them uh, for long enough. And ideas, you know, deep, dark ideas. And I think you know, a great, great example is uh, Google X, right? They, they have those you know, very uh, strange ideas, moonshots, that uh, they, they might look impossible, but you know, at some point, with new technologies, they can become you know, doable. Moments of stillness, I think everyone knows you know, moments of stillness that you don't have any idea. And then you know, I think patience is, is a great technique to, to help with that. And I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna talk more about, uh, about going from abstract to concrete when I talk about uh, uh, sketching. But uh, just, you know, I think sometimes it's really, really helpful to step back and, and look at things in a, in a more general uh, level. And the last one is, you know, small ideas. Sometimes, you know, great ideas, they are just a bunch of small good ideas. So I think that's uh, also very helpful. I would like to talk a little bit about sketch. And one of the professions that I'm, I'm a big fan of is uh, architecture. I think uh, they, they're very creative. And I think it's very similar to data people because they have to go from a very uh, uh, abstract request from someone, right? I, I want a house by the beach. And, and then they have to go through the process to turn that idea into something practical, which I think is very similar to the work that we do. And I'd like to show a, a video by a famous architect uh, in the US and that talks about uh, the creative process, the process uh, in architecture. And I think it's very uh, helpful for, for us as analysts. I'm an architect who loves to draw. My name is Barry Burkus. I'm in my studio in Santa Barbara. And we're going to look at a house that we designed and tell you how and why we designed the house the way it is. Clients came to us and they said, we want to build on the beach. We want to build in a place that has great ocean views. We want to build a house that allows us to bring our extended family home, but we want to have a place that's private for them also. So we looked at putting the living kitchen across the back to enjoy the view, the library to enjoy the view, 
a stairway that went upstairs so the master bedroom sat over the top of the kitchen area and a guest room over the living room and a bridge that connected that and the guest over here and actually another bridge that connected the guest to their own bedroom suites which were over a motor court in the front. So as you start to, this becomes a house. It is a drawing that as you start to sketch, you, you draw a diagram and the diagram becomes architecture. So what we were looking at once again was the ocean that ran along the area here. We're looking at, once again, winds that came from the west side over here, sun that came east and west. And we looked at the kitchen being on the morning side of the house. Always think about the kitchen enjoying east light. That sun is a wonderful thing to gain in the morning. In the afternoon, the warmth in the living room. And we looked at the house as it around a courtyard so that if the winds came, that we would end up being able to shelter the people around a fireplace in a courtyard that we came through from motor court, which was the garages in front. So very simply then, this became a living room with a fireplace sitting in the floor, seating areas around the fireplace, the dining room in this area here, the kitchen that was back in this side of the house on the east side with sun coming in in the morning, and the idea that the library on this edge of the house would enjoy the quiet, and we could block the west sun with that, but we're watching the beach, looking at the surf, looking at a pool that sits in the yard, and it became a place that water in an infinity pool poured over into the ocean visually and then water in the front kept the acoustics that were from the noise of the road and, this, and the uh, train away from the inners of the house. Enter here, look to light, look to the right, the library, a piano, look to the left through the dining room towards the kitchen, views up and down the coast. But all houses that we work on become diagrams that are bubbles, then start to become harder lines and the forms start to come together. And it's an exercise in thinking with the hand and the mind that will go from just a little bit more detail than this to the computer where it really becomes an organized piece put together by the designers that are working with me on the house. So it all begins as a pattern and a diagram the idea of where things are and how they interrelate adjacencies and the opportunities of the sun in the afternoon, the sun in the morning, the views to the water, and the idea that the bridge puts together the guest and the master looking down into the wonderful views of the house. The people that have this house are wonderful clients and it's a house that we are very, very proud of as architects. And that, I think, is the greatest reward an architect can have, is a happy client, a great building, and a place that they want to go back and visit because of the meaning of the piece that they've designed and the strength of the architecture. So, there are great clients. Of course, there are great clients. They have an infinity pool, which is pretty amazing. And, but what I like about the video is, you know, thinking with your hand, right? It's patterns and diagrams that you know, become architecture. And I think, you know, very often we, you know, go to our computers and we start typing and programming and, you know, we don't step back and look at things, you know, with a broader view. And I think that's really important. And drawing is, is sketching is a great technique to do that. And, you know, one example, I, I did uh, an integration between uh, Google Analytics and R. The, and, and one of the things, I went to R and I started, you know, playing with it and programming and try, trying to build the charts. And, and at some point, I you know, stepped back and I said, you know, maybe I'll just you know, draw what I, you know, the outcome and maybe it will help me you know, then go to R and you know, bring the data from Google Analytics and, and visualize it. And what I came up with was this. And of course, it's not the same thing because you know, the original one, I didn't think about all the constraints, right? For example, the, the different of scale of the charts and, and things like that. So I ended up, instead of having three lines in each chart, I had, you know, three sets of charts for, for, each, uh, for each state in this case. And, and I think, you know, drawing really helped me understand what kind of outcome I wanted to, 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 to get without, you know, thinking about the constraints too much. Now, another uh, example is uh, I, I used to, before I worked at Google, I used to be a consultant. And one of the things that, 
one of the meetings that I remember very well, it was with a, with a startup, and they were really smart about data, and they were, you know, asking all this data, and, and, you know, very interesting things they were asking, but, you know, I couldn't really understand what exactly they wanted, so I said, no, draw whatever you want me to, to give you, right? And, and, and then we started drawing in the whiteboard, and, you know, they, they draw some charts and tables and stuff like that, and then, you know, at the end of the, the meeting, we had the much better idea of what exactly we wanted to get from the data. So I think that's a, a very good technique as well. Now, I, once, you know, we define the audience, and then we, you know, had an idea, right, and hypothesis, and then we sketch, right, so now we know more or less what we want to get. Now, you know, we, let's go get the data. And, you know, devil is in the details. We probably, you know this expression. And I think, you know, the, the person that created it probably just signed a mortgage contract because, you know, it's really, the way it works, you know, lots of details and the devil is really in the details. But I think, you know, the expression that I like more is God is in the details because I think, you know, through the details, you really understand better who are you dealing with. And I think with data, you know, the details are really what matter because, you know, it's really, really important to get the details right. And, you know, one of the, the, the ways that I believe, you know, when you're getting the data, especially when you're asking the data from someone else, and, you know, in this case, I was asking from, from someone, from a developer, to get data through the Google Analytics API into an internal system, and I was trying to explain what exactly I want, and, and then, you know, suddenly I said, maybe I'll just draw a table and get me this table into our internal system. You know, and, and further, you know, I thought about, you know, with Google Analytics, we have uh, green, there are dimensions, and, and, and blue, there are metrics, so it's another way to help. So anything that you can do to help to make, you know, the request, really, really detailed, I think that's really important. So that's uh, one thing about getting data. Now exploring the data, I'm gonna talk about, you know, some simple things, you know, especially here at Strata, but I think they're really important and things to keep in mind when analyzing data. So when exploring data, now I'll, I'll talk about analysis and, and visualization, which, which I think they're the most important things uh, with data exploration. You know, those three things I think are really important when looking at data, which is filtering, sorting, and grouping. And I like to use a few examples from, uh, from Google Analytics, from our interface, how you do those things there. And so, first of all, filtering, I think one example, something that we just launched you know, a few weeks ago, which is bot filtering. And as you might know, you know, search engines, they have crawlers that crawl websites to index them. And then when someone searched something, then Google or another search engine looks on the index and then provides search result. Now, the problem is that those bots, sometimes they can trigger web analytics uh, tags, which means that when you look at uh, a solution like Google Analytics, there might be bots and customers in there. And it's very important if you're trying to optimize a website for customers that you don't see those bot traffic in there, right? So, so this is an example of filtering data that is not useful so that you can focus on whatever you're doing. Now, the second thing, sorting, and this is, you know, so we're looking at a simple uh, table at Google Analytics that you can see traffic source and you can see, you know, conversion rates or transaction rates by traffic source. And, you know, if you go and, and, and do that, you, you're sorting by transaction rate. Now, the problem is that as you can see, we have, as you can't see, we have a, a few, uh, the first few lines, they have 100% transaction rate, but they have just, you know, one session in each one, which is not very meaningful. Now, there is an option that you can do, you can change the sort type, right? So instead of using the default, you use a weighted sort type, which means that Google Analytics will sort not only based on transaction rate, but also based on the size of uh, the number of sessions and other metrics. And the last one that I'd like to talk about is in terms of analysis is grouping. And, you know, this is also a simple uh, example from uh, our enhanced e-commerce solution that you can see, you know, uh, transactions by product, which is very interesting because if you have a, an e-commerce website, for example, you can see which products they are, the, you know, top selling products, but also you would like to group them into categories so that you can see you know, by category, 
which, uh, which categories are the best ones so that you can uh, optimize your website. So those are three simple examples when it comes to analysis, filtering, sorting, and grouping. Now, when we talk about visualization, I would like to mention three really important things. First one is it has to be beautiful, right? That's, I think, the first thing about the visualizations. And I like to look at trends, right? So you don't look at data points because, you know, if you tell me 500,000 uh, people were on the website yesterday, it doesn't mean a lot, right? You would like to see, you know, from January to July, you know, what's the trend, and, and then you can see if it's good or bad. And, and more than that, right, because if you look at from January to July, there might be some kind of seasonability because, you know, January is winter and July is summer, so you would really want to compare between uh, different trends. And the last one, search for relationships. Now, one example from junk charts, I don't know if you know, uh, recycling chart junk into junk art. It's a very nice blog. And, and one of the examples that I like very much is uh, this chart that uh, what he does is uh, Kaizen uh, is recycling, you know, really bad charts that he finds into great charts. And this one is about the car sales in the US. And, you know, it's a horrible chart, right? You, you can't understand anything, but, you know, you can see that it's growing somehow or the, the major trend, which is, you know, the size of the, the bars. But, but apart from that, you can't understand individual uh, trends, right? And, and then he started to play with it. He turned that, you know, instead of looking at monthly trends, he was looking at quarterly trends. And then he, you know, merged all the cars into brands. And then he turned it into a line chart, which is, you know, way better because then we, you start to, sorry, to visualize the trends of all the brands and then you can compare the brands. And, you know, of course, it's a much more beautiful chart, right? And another example, something that I, that I created not long ago is, you know, you're looking at, you know, page views per session, the gray bars and transaction rates, which are the green bars. And you can, you know, it's very clear the relationship between them. And this is from January to July, right? And then you can start asking questions like, you know, maybe in January, just that people stay longer because, you know, it's winter, so they're at home. And then in July, they're more impul impulsive because, you know, they just want to finish with it and go to the beach, right? So that's about visualization. And the last thing, you know, telling stories. And I think, you know, it's, it's really a major thing because if you don't craft the story in a good way, you know, people, they just won't listen to it. They won't listen to the, to the data. And I like very much the, I read a book by Dan Rome, which is a show and tell. And he also has a very good presentation on YouTube that he did at the Google offices. It's a, so his book is about, you know, how to tell stories. And according to him, there are only four storylines that you can use when you prepare a story to tell someone. So there is the report, which is, you know, conveying information. And then there is the, the, the explanation which is, you know, you're trying to teach new insights or, or some kind of uh, ability. And the pitch, which you're trying to uh, change the way people do something and beliefs is you're trying to, to change uh, people's beliefs, right? So basically, this is what you want to change on people, right? And, and I think, you know, when you're doing an analysis, you, you should, you know, be very uh, focused on that, right? I want to change the amount of information in other people, right? Or I, or I want to change the way people act. So I think that's really important when you're crafting the story to tell someone. So basically some takeaways. First of all, you know, define the audience. It's really important to, to craft the analysis in a way that it's uh, 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 good for a specific audience. Then you get some good ideas because otherwise people just won't listen to it. You sketch it so that you can, you know, go from abstract to concrete. You get the data, sort, filter, group, visualize, and of course, you know, other uh, data analysis techniques. You tell the story. And, and, and to finish, I'd like to show a short video uh, about, you know, the power of stories again. And Is this thing even on? Yeah, that means it's recording. We all love stories. We're born for them. They can't be artificially evoked. It doesn't always mean plot or fact. 
take 48,327. They aren't an actual exact science. That's what's so special about stories. They're not predictable. It's capturing a truth from your experience. It can cross the barriers of time, real and imagined, expressing values you personally feel deep down to your core. Thank you. Happy analyzing. Questions? By the way, my, my father, he was a statistics professor. And one of the things he used to tell us is that uh, by the end of every class, he would ask, you know, any questions. And when there were no questions, he would say, you know, so let's just start from the beginning. Thank you. What? No.